Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thank you for welcoming me here today. Um, I did a little taster on this work at the Midlands uh, Maternity Festival um, and hopefully got a few people interested because, yes, it's very difficult to pronounce Ellis Danlos Syndrome, uh, let alone understand it. And um, when I started, I didn't know anything about it either. So we're learning together because there's very little known about it. But I'm going to tell you today what we've learned so far uh, and what we're trying to do. And hopefully um, you'll go away understanding more about hypermobile Ellis Danlos Syndrome in, in pregnancy. And hopefully you'll be included in our research that we're, we're about to, to sort of start collecting data on uh, and analysing. So bear with me. So this is me. Um, I'm Sally Pizarro. I'm also known as the academic midwife on, on Facebook. And I try and engage midwives in academic careers and research and evidence-based practice publishing their own work. Don't be scared of it. It's not that scary, really. Um, and I blog on certain topics in research, etc. And yes, I'm on Twitter, because who wants to leave their pyjamas, really, and go outside? Just stay on social media. <laughs> yeah, so that's me. And this is the EDS maternity team. So it's myself, um, Dr. Gemma Pierce, who's a psychologist, and Dr. Emma Reinhold, who's a GP. And we've come together really um, to, because we both, we all have this fascination into um, what is this condition and how does it affect pregnancy. I don't have Ellis Danlos syndrome, but Emma and Gemma do. Um, and we were noticing together on Twitter that there was this kind of swathe of women who were talking about terrible experiences during their childbearing period um, and how that was a catalyst for things getting worse uh, for their condition uh, and vice versa. So the, the condition was making their pregnancy um, you know, affected and it was, their pregnancy was affecting their condition. Um, but no one knew anything about it. And the main thing they were telling us was, why doesn't my midwife know about this? So Gemma came up to me working in Coventry University and said, oh, Sally, you're a midwife. What would you do if someone came to you with Ellis Danlos syndrome and was having a baby? And I said, I don't know. I'd probably refer to them, them to someone who knew something about this because I certainly don't. Um, and she said, well, I think this is a real problem. I think people are really struggling and, and no one's listening to them. And so, of course, that pricked up my ears and thinking, well, if there's a, a group of women that need support and need, a, need kind of attention in this, let's, let's have a further look. So, like I said, uh, Dr. Emma Reinhold has, also has hypermobile Ellis Danlos syndrome. She's had children and she's a GP. And she says, yeah, you know, where it's so difficult trying to find um, the appropriate referrals for these people. No one can identify it. And she worked with the Royal College of GPs to produce an EDS, Ellis Danlos Syndrome toolkit to, to support GPs to understand this. And so in terms of maternity care, we've come together under the hashtag EDS Maternity to do some work to find out how this affects childbearing women. So what is Ellis Danlos Syndrome? It's a condition, a genetic condition, hereditary, although we haven't identified the exact gene, um, which affects connective tissues throughout the body. There are 14 subtypes of this condition, but hypermobile Ellis Danlos type is the most common, and that's about 80 to 90% of cases. So the others are really, really rare. We don't actually think that um, hypermobile Ellis Danlos syndrome is that rare, and hopefully we'll be publishing soon that the numbers that we think are actually um, affected by Ellis Danlos syndrome. Um, but on average, it's taking people around 16 years to get diagnosed, from first developing symptoms to being diagnosed. Women um, are taking 16 years to get diagnosed, and it affects far more women than men. Okay? So the reason the zebra's up here is because apparently uh, medical professionals, when they're going through their medical training, they're taught, when, when you see symptoms, a range of symptoms, don't think rare, exotic animals, exotic diseases. Think what is it most likely to be. Think, you know, when you hear hooves, think horses, not zebras, basically. And uh, people with Ellis Danlos syndrome are saying, basically, we are the zebra. Look for that zebra, because that's us. So the three um, kind of things that uh, characterize hypermobile Ellis Danlos syndrome is hypermobility uh, and skin hyperextensibility, so stretchy skin. Now, I can't demonstrate this for you because I don't have it, um, so I've got these pictures up. They also tend to bruise quite easily um, across all the conditions. So we can do the rubber glove test sign. So can anyone do this? Put your hand up like this and see if you can pull the skin at your knuckle and see that line of skin should just stop just 
um, over your knuckle. But if it goes all the way down here, it's called the rubber glove sign. And it's a sign of having hyperextensive skin. So now I want you to stand up, please, everybody. We're going to test how hypermobile we are. Now, this does not mean you have Ellis Danlos syndrome, so don't panic. It's literally a test of how hypermobile you are. So this is called the Baton score, and, and it's a score of nine overall. So you get one for each limb. So first of all, just with your um, hand, right hand, see if your right thumb can touch your wrist. That's one point if it can. Now the left, one point if it can. Mine cannot, you will see. And again on the right hand, if your little finger bends to a right angle, that's one point. And the left, if it bends to a right angle again, mine doesn't. Okay. Now your elbows. So do your elbows, if you stretch them out, do they hyperflex? Is there a kind of ridge there that goes back? No? And the other side, is there a ridge that goes up and down? No? Okay, now while you're standing... Can you see if you can put your hands flat on the floor from standing? I can't even touch my toes, let alone do that. Can anyone put their hands flat on the floor? Oh, I'm impressed, very impressed. Okay, so the last ones now, if you sit down next to somebody, you have to sit down next to someone to help, really, or at least put, put your... Put your leg up on someone or up on a chair. But if you put your leg up on someone, like your elbow, does your knee hyperextend? Either the right one or the left one. Okay. You get one point for each limb again. So did anybody get nine points? Anyone get full marks? Anyone get eight, seven points? Six points? Was anyone even counting? Oh, we got one over there. Excellent. So we don't think we're very hypermobile in this room, no? Is that a consensus? Okay, join the club. So when we look at that then in terms of being hypermobile and having this genetic condition and being pregnant, um, obviously we're all, um, if, you, if we are midwives in this room, uh, we're all aware of kind of the hormonal changes during pregnancy. So we know how the hormones affect ligaments, how they affect the stretching of the pelvis, stretching of everything, getting ready for birth. If you already have a con connective tissue disorder, bearing in mind connective tissues are in every organ of your body, um, how do we think that's going to affect pregnancy? Basically, yeah, we think that the, the connective tissues are going to stretch even further and perhaps even be more hypermobile than they already are. And then we've got the extra weight of the pregnancy, so the, the weight of the baby, the percent of the blood volume, etc., etc., And that's putting even more pressure on all of the ligaments that are already affected by this connective tissue disorder. Obviously, we've got increased cardiac output. We all know that. That's going to have effect on people who have postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, or POTS, as it's better known, which a lot of people with hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome have. About 70% of those with ehlers danlos syndrome will also have POTS. And that's basically a pooling of the blood. Um, whether you're sat down or lying, lying down, you suddenly stand up, and, and, the, and the, the blood pressure and the blood volume pools and cannot get to, to your vitals so you start to feel very dizzy. And so with the added on pregnancy complications, sometimes POTS can get better because of the added volume, uh, but it affects everyone differently. And the increased kind of uh, the breathing in a, the increased kind of pulmonary uh, oxygen intake and things but, um, throughout pregnancy as well, we're thinking about the increased demands on, on all of the organs there. So this results in a number of complications we found. Uh, we published uh, a literature review uh, on care considerations for people with hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome in pregnancy from what was already out there in the literature. And bearing in mind, this literature is not of extremely high quality. Some of it is case studies, some of it is opinion-based, some of it is we did this with this patient and this is what happened, um, which is important to capture, but it's not necessarily rigorous research. Uh, but we pulled all that together and said, okay, if we know this in the literature, um, then this is perhaps some of the things we, we should do to support um, childbearing women. But it, um, it, childbearing with ehlers danlos syndrome was often linked with fast precipitate births, fast labours, uh, hemorrhage, breach presentation, malpresentation. Uh, for various reasons, you're expecting the uterus to hold and birth a baby, yet it's all connective tissue, which 
um, it, it's hyper hyper extensive and, and kind of can shoot out babies quite quickly. Um, so, so they were the kind of things coming up in the literature. But we thought, do you know what? We better ask women <laughs> what they're actually experiencing, as well as all these clinical um, journals that are telling us the, uh, the various cases. So, we decided to to publish that review, um, get it out there. And what we found was lots of women were taking it to their midwives, taking it to their GPs and saying, this is me, this is me on paper, this is what happened to me, this is what you need to do. It was almost like some, finally they had some evidence to say, um, I, don't, you know, I, I don't know what to do, I need your help, um, here, here is me in a nutshell. So we had, uh, we've since had over 14,000 downloads of that paper in the British Journal of Midwifery. Uh, it was so popular that they made it open access for us very kindly. And it's been downloaded over 14,000 times. And we were given highly commended status for our impact award um, with that because people were using it literally to make decisions about their birthing experience. They were deciding whether or not to have another child because they now had this evidence and they were equipped with this evidence to say, um, right now I can make new choices about my birth and perhaps I can show this to healthcare professionals so they will listen to me because a lot of the time they felt they weren't being listened to. And also I was a finalist, um, I won second place in the Midwife of the Year award with the British Journal of Midwifery. So that was very exciting times. Um, and like I say, it's the most, still the most widely read on the British Journal of Midwifery site and it's open access still so you can um, click the link and read away and share it. So um, this is what people said about the... This is just shows you, really, how one simple piece of research and writing um, can affect so many people and so many pregnant women's lives. Um, this is what the kind of things they were saying when they read the paper. So um, as an EDS patient and a midwife, I say this guidance has been long overdue. So a lot of uh, midwives had EDS, and they came to us and said, wow, this is really good. I can not only use it for myself, but, but people I'm caring for. And then I'm showing this to my GP tomorrow. It's the first time since the birth of my daughter and diagnosis five years ago that I felt it possible to consider having a second child I've longed for. I didn't have the knowledge to advocate for proper care. Now I do, thanks to new research. And that's my favorite quote because that, that really shows how, people are, how women are using research to empower their own birth choices um, to help, the, help them make their decisions and also in f sort of work in partnership with the, with the healthcare professionals that they, that they require that care from um, to, to sort of make decisions together with them. And so, yes, we thought we'd better ask women what actually, um, what actually goes on after, after publishing that because it may be two different things. So we um, did an online uh, interview study. So we interview, I interviewed 40 um, women, talking to them over Skype um, on text. We thought it would be easier for them to do that rather than attend an interview or hold a phone or one of those things. So they, they sort of logged into Skype and I logged in as well and we had kind of conversations with them that way. A couple of them did want to do phone conversations but most of them were via online text. Um, bearing in mind, we didn't know how many people we were going to recruit. We tweeted one tweet to say, hello, we're looking for people with hypermobile and Lestanlos syndrome who've had babies to tell us about their experiences. And within one day, I had 200 emails in my inbox to say, I want to, I want to, I want to. Um, that would have been too many for a qualitative study, so we capped the number at the first 40 people to give us their consent forms. Um, and unfortunately the rest we had to say no to, although we, we will be asking um, their opinions in a survey that's, that's out now. So um, we asked them basically, what is it like? What was your experience like? So the first thing they said was that healthcare professionals were scared. They were scared. They didn't know what to do with them when things went wrong, i.e. they had a quick birth or they had a hemorrhage or, or said, I have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. They were panicked. So healthcare professionals were panicked. And you know yourself, if you're a healthcare professional and you're faced with something you don't know, the unknown, it does panic you. It's not a pleasant place to be in. You want to be empowered and have the education and knowledge to help women as best you can. Um, so that was the first finding. Uh, and they basically said, you know, they didn't know what it was, so they didn't listen to me. They didn't think I'd had it. They either told me it was really risky or no risk at all. They just didn't know what they were saying about it. Um, and they were often dismissed. Women were often dismissed for having real concerns about their pregnancy and their, and their condition. 
Um, often their pregnancy symptoms got worse or their, um, dis you know, they were disabled by their condition even further. So they would have more... Um, one thing that happens with ehlers Danlos Syndrome is that their joints dislocate, so it's called subluxation, where literally one woman was, sneeze was sneezing in pregnancy and her um, rib kept popping out every time she sneezed. Can't imagine what that's like. Um, and they actually started to disengage with services. So they said, you know what, I'm, being, I'm, I'm not being listened to, I'm not being heard, nobody is treating me in the way I need to, to be treated, I am no longer engaging with maternity services. And they would either choose a different doctor, they would choose a different midwife, they would stop attending, they would just do their own thing, um, because they couldn't talk to us in a way that, that was respectful and, and meaningful, uh, as we didn't listen to them. And obviously they felt anger, shame, guilt, depression, anxiety, all of those things that came with not being listened to, having traumatic experiences, um, and a poor experience in childbearing. And a lot of the time it, um, they said, you know, I wouldn't have any more children, I'm sticking to one. It was way too, way too much, way too bad, no one knew what to do with me, there's no way I'm going through that again. So many of them have just one child families. Uh, and also they said, you know, the anaesthetist uh, gave me um, anaesthesia, the, the midwife gave me lidnocaine, um, none of it worked, but they wouldn't listen to me. So they were ha there was these harrowing stories of uh, them having sutures and the midwife saying, you can't feel anything, you can't possibly, I've given you all of the dose of this. And they're saying, I can absolutely feel everything um, during cesarean sections and, and surgeries and, and, and suturing. And they know this from being to the dentist. They've been to the dentist for years and they know anaesthetic doesn't work on them. But this is a general thing with hypermobile ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Many people with that condition, anaesthetic and pain relief just doesn't work on them in the same way because it's acting on smooth connective tissue, which they have a condition that affects. So, yeah, we definitely need to learn more about that. And also they had these really, really quick births. Um, some of them talked about having really long latent phases of labor, irritable uteruses. Uh, I was in labor for weeks and weeks because obviously the uterus was just in, in a state of flux with this connective tissue disorder. Um, but all of a sudden, the baby would birth really quickly um, because the uterus was behaving slightly differently, which was a real shock, not only to them, but obviously the healthcare professional that had perhaps sent them home in early labor and they dilated to, f you know, fully dilated in an hour later and, and they're birthing. And actually, you know, in clinical practice, I've seen that happen quite a fair few times. And I, I wonder, and, and we wonder as a team, whether uh, potentially if we know that more people have ehlers Danlos Syndrome than we currently recognize, and a lot of them are having these fast births, then perhaps that's something that we can piece together in future to predict who may birth surprisingly quickly and take everyone by, <laughs> by surprise. So the lived experience, this is just a, a, a handful of quotes that the, that the women said. So I remember him saying, you're not hypermobile because you can't touch the floor. And I'm thinking, I'm eight months pregnant, of course I can't touch the floor. <laughs> that's my personal favorite. We each chose our favorite, that's mine. Um, and then it was refreshing when I saw the anaesthetist and he was aware of EDS. He listened and, he, and it was like a weight had been lifted off me, my mind. He told me that so many of us with EDS are not used to being believed. So actually it's refreshing when they meet somebody with knowledge of this, someone that gets it. Um, but it's, it's few and far between that they meet that. There's a few specialists out there. And I didn't have any other children because I was too scared. That was a general theme that came through. So in terms of our future plans then, so that's what we found out from the li existing literature, that's what we found out from women who, were, um, who had had babies, they told us their experience. So we now have two international surveys informed by 4,000 votes on what matters most. So we put out um, some, some blogs on, on tell us well, you know, what matters most to you with the ehlers Danlos Syndrome, what do you want us to research next? And uh, they said, we, you know, if you're going to do surveys, we're doing one for healthcare professionals and one for childbearing women. And they said, if you're going to do those, these are the things we want asked. These are the things we want to know. So we, we've started those now. And um, we're going to do knowledge mobilization meetups with key stakeholders. So we've already been to several um, uh, hospitals, maternity units, and, and talked to other people and kind of said, how can we help these women? How can we... Um, make things better. Public engagements events, we've been doing that. We'll be putting videos up soon on YouTube of how we've engaged the public in this issue. And we're hopefully going to co-create educational tools with uh, midwives and experts to um, put together some things to educate um, healthcare professionals on, on what to do and, and what this is. 
And we're going to hopefully publish um, new estimated prevalence rates and key findings very soon so that we can say, look how many people this actually affects. These are our numbers. Now let's get serious about making a change. Um, so how can you help? So this is my call to action. Everybody in this room, please go to this link. And when you have gone to this link, please share it with your colleagues. We are collecting survey responses until the end of August. This is the um, staff survey we want everyone to complete. You don't have to know anything about ls Danlos syndrome, although you should do after this talk. Um, but you don't have to know anything about it. You, if you don't know anything, we want to know that you don't know anything. Um, um, it's not just midwives we want to uh, complete this. Anyone that delivers care to childbearing women, so MSWs, obstetricians, anaesthetists, anyone working in maternity services. Um, and, and this is in the UK, USA, Ireland, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, we're doing an international survey, um, we're one, one for childbearing women, but this is the one I want you guys to complete. No experience necessary. Just click on the link, and, um, and it will take you about 20 to 30 minutes just to tell us what you do and don't know about hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome and what might help you and your colleagues to, to understand more about it. Uh, and if you can't, last message basically, if you can't connect the issues, then please think connect, connective tissues because we really think that this affects far more women than we know about. And it's the start of a research journey for us really because there's so little known, unfortunately, um, that we need to build that evidence base, strengthen that evidence base, make sure it's rigorous, make sure we know what we're talking about, uh, and then co-create some solutions together with women and maternity staff so that we can make things better for these women. So these are the final links, really. That's our paper published so far. Feel free to get in touch. And please, the survey really needs filling out. So um, I'll leave you with that slide. Uh, and if there's any questions, let me know. Thank you. My name's Bethany, and I've, like, I got diagnosed with Sublox and I'm hypermobile. But I feel like there's an issue with the whole of the NHS with it because, like, I've been to doctor's appointments and they're like, you're not hypermobile and then your arm's dislocated and then someone will only do it when they can see it. Yeah. But I think it's just erasing it because you know your body the best, especially during labour. You know yourself better than anyone else. So it's just making sure that everyone's listened to yeah, hopefully we'll get that message across when we do these educational tools, definitely. I know that's a key message. Someone in the back. Hello, my name is Rohana, and I'm from Mummy Yoga. Uh, I provide perinatal yoga services, and this is something that we see a lot, actually, and, and, and what you're saying, that the numbers are not as little as uh, the, the previous research indicates. What can people in the community, such as ourselves, do in order to either highlight the issues or educate the women, all of, you know, moving away from uh, traditional antenatal care, the community care, the outside, the, the support that we have in the community? What can we do? I think it's, again, people say, what should I do in this situation? What should I do in this situation? It's so hard to say when so many of these answers need answering. Um, and I'm really reluctant to give definite do this, you know, in this kind of way because the, the evidence isn't there yet to say exactly what we should do. I think it's more important to raise awareness through um, publications, through doing this survey and co-creating educational tools. One thing we will be doing at the moment, we're looking at developing an iLearn module with the RCM. Uh, on uh, hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome for maternity staff, well, RCM members. And that will hopefully bring out a lot of the key messages about listening to women and listening to their own voice. And also not one size fits all because every hypermobile person will have their own symptoms that they're dealing with. And so one, one thing working for one person will not work for another person. So that makes it even more complex. So I think it's again going back to the listen to the person um, and, and having a general idea of what hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome is uh, and how it affects people in general um, and what not to do. So party tricks and things that where you can do all these crazy, you know, party tricks. Um, avoid doing those so much because they, that will damage ligaments over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.